Hello and welcome to Business 360. I'm Shireen Bhan. The headlines we're tracking for you this evening. The Sensex and the Nifty declined for the fifth session, marking the longest losing streak in eight months. The Sensex loses over 130 points, more than 7 lakh crore rupees of investor wealth wiped out in the last five sessions. Adani stocks continue to be under pressure with the group losing 20,000 crore rupees in market cap today. A CNBC TV18 analysis shows LIC sold 10% of its Adani holding in January this year and its investment in the group has turned negative as of today's market close. Z Entertainment moves the NCLAT, seeks a stay on insolvency proceedings after the NCLT admitted Indusin Bank's plea. A statement from Puneet Goenka's office says he's taking all necessary steps to protect the interests of stakeholders and achieve a timely completion of the Z Sony merger. Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman meets US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen ahead of the crucial G20 meeting in Bengaluru to discuss perspectives on strengthening multilateral development banks and global debt vulnerabilities. Yellen says the US will make it clear to the Chinese government and companies that provide material support or assistance to Russia that this will be a very serious concern. Relief for former Jet Airways Chairman Naresh Goyal and wife Anita, the Bombay High Court quashes a February 2020 enforcement case information report against them in a money laundering case. The Goyals had moved the High Court seeking the quashing of the ECIR. The Supreme Court grants an interim bail to Congress spokesperson Pavan Khera after he was deplaned at the Delhi airport and arrested for his comments against Prime Minister Modi's father. FIRs have been filed against him in Assam, Lucknow and Varanasi. The Apex Court has also issued notices to the Assam and UP police to club all the FIRs. Reports of shelling in southern Donetsk in Ukraine ahead of the first anniversary of the Russia invasion. Ukraine claims to have repelled 90 Russian attacks over the past 24 hours. Well, starting the market action, a volatile day saw the Lal Street closing the session flat. Markets down for the fifth straight day, posting the biggest loss that we've seen since June of 2022. Now, the Nifty and the Sensex failed to hold on to the intraday gains, ending mildly in the red. The broader markets fared slightly better. The BSE companies have erased a market cap of over 7 lakh crore rupees in the last five sessions. For the series, the Nifty lost 2% to record its biggest fall in a series since September. So, Ruby joins us now to wrap up the day's trading action for us. Surbi continues to be weak for the markets. Well, this is a market that seems to be in no man's land. Nothing is moving it. The bulls will, however, uh, see this as a you know sign of relief considering the huge rubbing that we saw yesterday in trade. Today was a very cautious session right from the word go. The market was trading in a very narrow 120 to about 150 point trading band. Uh, we did have the, the monthly expiry played out. So there was some volatility around 3 o'clock. But net result is that we've closed at the flat line with uh, absolutely no sense of direction whatsoever. The talking points continue to be the same, direction of interest rates and whether the RBI will hike again in April, what the Fed is doing, rising bond yields in India and obviously internationally. And that's really keeping a lid on momentum. Let me quickly come down to today's movers and shakers. So there was some shine in the metal side of the market, actually metals and commodities. So you had stocks like uh, uh, Hindalco, Tata Steel, a little bit of green on an ONGC for that matter during the course of the day. So some of these names were active. Then you had a, a couple of the banks that started to come back in towards the close of the session and that prevented a wider fall. So names like uh, Axis Bank, SBI, Kotak Mahindra Bank, uh, they pretty much sort of uh, held the floor for the market, if I could say that. And then there was, of course, the stock that has been the star of 2023 after being the star of 2022, and I'm talking about ITC. Lifetime highs today for the stock once again. It's inching closer to the 400 mark, and that uh, gave some respite to the bulls. But then pressure on the other side. The trends are very unclear, and a lot of the heavier stocks like Reliance, HDFC Bank, they continue to see selling pressure today, and there was not much clarity. Broader markets, uh, well, really, it's extremely stock-specific in terms of the action. For instance, a Sonata software today where the company's gone ahead and done an acquisition that was in focus z was in focus uh, because of all the ongoings at the nclt in the company then challenging that at the nclat stock was down 15 percent at one point in time but then closed with a cut of just about three to four percent so it's extremely stock specific there isn't a momentum play in this market and for what it's worth i mean the market's really searching for triggers and a sense of direction that doesn't seem to be coming right now 
Sirvi, many thanks for joining us. And there is no respite for the Adani Group either. Eight of the group's ten listed entities ended in the red today. Adani Total, Adani Green, Adani Transmission and Adani Power hitting lower circuits over the course of the trading session. The group has lost a market cap to the tune of 20,000 crore rupees today. And this takes the total market cap loss since the Hindenburg report was released on the 24th of January to around 12 lakh crore rupees. As of today, the Adani Group's market cap stands at 7.4 lakh crores. Now, the value of life insurance corporations in Investment in the Adani Group has turned negative. An analysis by CNBC TV18 based on public disclosures by LIC shows that the insurer has sold 10% of its holding in January this year. The Hindenburg report was released on the 24th of January. The LIC chairman, MR Kumar, told CNBC TV18 that Adani shares have not been sold since the report was released. But as things stand, LIC is sitting on losses of 234 crore rupees on its Adani investment to date. Yash joins us now with the details of the CNBC TV18 analysis. Yash. Well, Shireen, the big headline is that LIC's investments in Adani Group companies have turned negative today. Uh, we put together some interesting numbers supporting that headline and these numbers also throw some interesting facts. Uh, interestingly, LIC is likely to have sold Adani Group shares worth 6,400 crore rupees between January 1st to January 24th. How did we arrive at that conclusion? Now look at the turn of events on January 27th. LIC disclosed that the value of its investments in Adani Group companies was 56,142 crore rupees. When the same was calculated, taking in consideration the December shareholding pattern, then it comes to 62,550 crore rupees. The difference is about 6,400 crore rupees or 10% of LIC's holding in Adani Group companies, which is likely to have been sold between between January 1st to January 24th. Now let's come to the point of LIC's investment in the Adani Group companies turning negative. Now the closing value today for LIC's investment uh, is uh, about uh, about uh, 33,215 crore rupees. Adjust this to a possible 10% sale, uh, which was made by LIC in uh, January, and that will give you the number of 29,893 crore rupees. Now compare this to LIC's cost of purchase, which was 30,127 crore rupees. So so as things stand, LIC is sitting on losses of about 234 crore rupees. As I mentioned, LIC bought stocks at about 30,127 crore rupees and its investment value as of today's market close is uh, 29,893 crore rupees. This shows that LIC is in red by about 234 crore rupees. Well, thanks very much, uh, Yash, for joining us with the details there. That is, of course, the CNBC TV18 analysis. Moving on, here's the action from the commodity market. Crude oil prices continue to trade in a range. Prices have seen some recovery after six days of losses. Concerns over potential interest rate hikes by central banks and a build-up in crude inventory weighing on sentiment. But back home, the big corporate story. Z Entertainment has now moved the NCLAT seeking a stay on the insolvency proceedings. Yesterday, the NCLT on the back of Indusind Bank's plea allowed the initiation of insolvency proceedings against Z. Lata joins us now to explain what this could mean for the company's proposed merger with Sony and what legal experts have to say. Lata. The, uh a company Z Entertainment had no option but to go to NCLAT because the NCLT process has to be stopped. They have to get a stay. If the NCLT process runs, then the promoters and the management are taken off and the committee of creditors will take over the company, which obviously they don't want because uh, they have to run the company and conduct the merger. Now, wh what are the chances that Z will get a stay? Uh, the uh, chances, according to legal sources, is good because the uh, loan in dispute is not something that Z has taken from Indescent. Apparently, what Z has done is, it is Z is itself almost debt-free. It has given a comfort uh, to Indescent in a loan it has given to its old group company, City Network. And uh, the, the, the loan, in technical language, arrangement is called debt service reserve account. And apparently, the comfort that Z gave was that it will always ensure that in that account, one quarter's interest and principal is maintained. But then, see, uh, City Network became an NP. It defaulted. And now, Indescent is asking Z to pay up that money because it gave that comfort letter. It is seeing it as a guarantor. Z has taken uh, Indescent to the Delhi High Court where it is fighting that case. So, chances are Z will tell NCLAT that this is actually 
a, a, a loan in dispute that Indus Indus is take, trying to take from them and therefore this uh, NCLT uh, petition should be quashed. Now, does NCLAT have the right? There is, uh, There are precedents that NCLAT can take such a view. The Supreme Court in the Vidarbha Industries case had said that NCLAT can, or for that matter even NCLT, can decide whether to admit a case or not uh, on the merits of the case. And here Z has a good chance of saying that uh, this is a bad case in the first place. The other things that apparently Z can bring forth is that uh, uh, the uh, claim was made by Indusin during COVID. And at that time, many of those cases were not allowed because of the, the COVID period. Uh, so, the case is not even maintainable. Z can also argue that when NCLT pronounced the judgment, it had not allowed Z to make a case. It had only taken written submission, not uh, entertained them in person, and therefore procedure was not followed. According to Legal Legal, Z has a good chance of getting a stay, but we will, until the stay comes, you can't be sure. Yes, we cannot preempt what I the NCLT may uh, or may uh, not do. Lata many. <laughs> Yeah, she, apparently <laughs> yes, even the amount in dispute is only 83 crore we are given to understand. All right, we will be tracking that uh, developing story. Lata, many thanks for joining us. Now, Bengaluru is playing host to the first major G20 event under India's leadership. Finance ministers and central bank governors will be in a huddle to discuss several issues that plague the global economy. India's finance minister, Nirmala Sitharaman, met with U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen today. Yellen addressed the media earlier, asserting that the support for Ukraine is her top priority. She also spoke about working with countries to avoid export restrictions on food grains. Yellen also spoke about the stress being faced by many emerging economies and called on China to help restructure debt for countries like Sri Lanka, which are struggling to stay afloat. I will continue to push for all bilateral official creditors, including China, to participate in meaningful debt treatments for developing countries and emerging markets in distress. I will also be discussing international coordination on debt restructuring for middle-income countries. Well, that is the U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and Parikshit Luthra joins us now live from Bengaluru. Parikshit, uh, you know, meetings underway uh, in our conversation with the World Bank President David Malpass. He was hopeful that there could be a positive outcome as far as the debt resolution matter is concerned. What are you picking up from the conversations that you've had? Well, uh, the conversation around debt restructuring is bound to be a tricky one, a sensitive one. We believe that uh, no proposal for haircut is acceptable to China. In fact, China is urging other nations to urge uh, the multilateral development banks to take a haircut as well. So there seems to be a deadlock on that front. We believe that discussions on the communique, the G20 communique, will go on till late tonight. Uh, there are some meetings which are also taking place at 1 a.m. where central bank governors, finance ministers are participating. So you can understand the sensitivity around issues like debt, uh, uh, sensitivity around issues like uh, Ukraine as well. So Secretary Janet Yellen, while she was addressing the press a short while back, said that uh, building support for Ukraine and uh, highlighting the economic impact of the war will be her number one priority. But whether the communique names Russia in the statement, that remains to be seen, seems very unlikely because G20 works with consensus. Uh, there, is, there are two major meetings going on currently as we speak. Uh, and let me also add that uh, all major central bank governors of G20 nations are here. We also saw uh, the, uh, the Fed chair, Jerome Powell, here a short while ago. He was going into another meeting. Uh, there, there are discussions ongoing on uh, the cryptocurrency framework as well. Uh, there is a discussion going on uh, payments infrastructure, cross-border payments, and also generally about the state of the global economy. So let's see what uh, the key outcomes are. Uh, Nirbala Sitaraman has a packed schedule. She has at least 10 meetings, bilateral meetings, over the next two days. Yes, it is going to be a packed schedule for the finance minister. And we will co keep coming back to Parikshit for the latest there from the G20 meetings underway in Bengaluru. We will head into a break, but up next, an Aon survey highlights that salaries in India are expected to increase by 10.3% on an average in 2023. That and more when we get back.
while you're watching Business 360, a survey by professional services firm Aon highlights that salaries in India are expected to increase by 10.3% on an average in 2023. This is slightly lower compared to the actual increase of 10.6% last year. The survey is based on inputs from 1,400 organizations across 44 sectors and also highlights that India continues to have the highest salary increases in the region and among major world economies like the US and UK. However, attrition numbers in India remain near two decade highs. There's been an increase in involuntary attrition on account of recent layoffs. Joining me now is Rupank Chaudhary, Partner and Chief Commercial Officer of India and South Asia at Aon. Now, Rupank, thanks very much for joining us. Well, this looks better than one was expecting, given that there are still a fair number of uncertainties that we're dealing with global and some domestic factors as well. Hi, Shereen. Thank you for having me here. Yes, uh, that's right. Uh, at 10.3%, I think the numbers uh, continue to be double digit for the second year running. And it is a little higher than what we thought it would be. Uh, I think a bunch of factors are at play here. Uh, I think some of the sectors that are strongly linked uh, to the India growth story, focused on domestic uh, consumption, like manufacturing, real estate, FMCG, pharma, have done really well and have given sizable hikes as compared to previous years. And while the increments on some of the traditional sectors, traditionally high paying sectors like uh, IT, financial services, e-commerce are a little lower than last year, but they're still in high double digit because the attrition numbers continue to be very, very high in those sectors. So I think it's a bunch of factors at play here. One is overall business sentiment, which is coming out very positive, very high attrition. And some of the sectors which have struggled to pay in the last few years, which are largely linked to our uh, domestic uh, spending and consumption, uh, are showing a pretty rosy picture on both the hiring as well as on the increment side. You know, that's interesting that you talk about the kind of increments that even the tech sector is seeing because globally what we are seeing is a significant number of jobs being cut across the tech sector. Uh, here there have been cases where onboarding of new recruits has either been delayed or, uh, you know, the, the onboarding terms have been changed much, at much lower salaries. Uh, how are you reading what's happening on the tech side of things specifically at this point in time in India? So if you were to break up the tech sector, if you look at uh, tech products, right, the numbers are high, uh, but uh, they, they have been higher in the past, uh, right? Uh, and they continue to still be at a fairly reasonably positive outlook. If you look at uh, IT services, uh, the numbers have fallen a little bit as compared to last year. So within technology also, we are seeing different factors uh, at play. And again, the whole domestic versus the global phenomena of how aligned these sectors are, are at play. Attrition continues to be very, very high. Uh, and as long as attrition is very high in these sectors, because other sectors continue to, uh, you know, shop from these sectors, uh, the numbers end up still going up. So within the tech services sector, we are seeing a bit of a, a dichotomy, but we are seeing healthy increments still being given. However, they are not as high as what we had seen in 2018, 2019, 2020. Yes, uh, that is when the war for talent in the tech sector uh, was uh, at its peak. But uh, uh, Rupang, I also want to understand what you are seeing now across the hospitality, the aviation uh, sectors as well. Uh, you know, because these were sectors that were impacted the most on account of COVID. And now we're seeing a, a revival uh, and the demand for talent uh, returning to these sectors. In fact, many are arguing that there isn't enough by way of people who want to join. What are you seeing there in terms of retention, in terms of being able to uh, uh, to make this a lot more attractive for people to stay on? So uh, I think that's an important point, right? Uh, because a lot of these sectors which were uh, sort of, you know, impacted adversely during the uh, COVID years have actually sprung back and are hiring. So the hiring outlook for these sectors has gone up. The business outlook for these sectors have gone up. And as a result, salary increments also are higher than what we had seen in the last two years. And the projection numbers for this year is higher than for previous years, which is not what we are seeing for the globally aligned sectors. So be it automotive, be it uh, manufacturing, be it FMCG, be it retail, be it uh, telecom, be it cement, be it hospitality. All of these sectors are close to the uh, double-digit numbers now. And they were, these were all struggling in the 5-6% category during the difficult COVID years. So clearly, there is a spurt. There is... Uh, you know, a strong uh, demand for talent uh, out here. A lot of these sectors are hiring talent 
from the IT sector, from the sector which are not doing so well because demand for digital and tech talent is across. It's in the traditional sectors as well. So, but clearly this is a big rebound and a big resurgence we have seen, which wasn't the case in the last few years. And this is certainly putting pressure on the overall number that we are seeing for India Inc. Uh, Rupang, before I let you go, so on balance, uh, the data and the trends do seem to suggest that we are still in a positive environment as far as the job market goes. At least I'm talking about the formal uh, job market. Yes, uh, if you were to actually look at the estimates, uh, the hiring estimates are going up. The business, so I mean, we track three broad parameters when we do the study, right? We ask companies about uh, their business outlook, their hiring outlook, and their increment outlook. And all three, uh, are looking fairly good when we're talking about moderate growth, not very high growth, but moderate growth. We are seeing almost 50, 60 percent of the companies talking about, uh, you know, a positive sentiment in each of these uh, three sectors. But of course, there are other factors at play. Uh, but the fact is that as long as attrition is going to be high and the demand and supply of talent remains a concern and inflation uh, is also going to be high, I think we can expect, uh, you know, fair amount of increments coming across in this year as well. All right, so a double-digit increment, that is the expectation as per the Aeon survey for this year. Uh, Rupank, many thanks for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Appreciate your time and we wish you the very best of luck. That's it then on this edition of Business 360. Thanks very much for watching. Do stay tuned to CNBC TV 18. The news will return right after this. Go powered by 